Good evening. So good to see you guys here. Um, I know we're, uh, we're kind of waiting for the rest of everybody to pull up. It's a, it's a Friday night. Everybody's uh, getting out of schools and work to get out here, but well done for everybody that's here tonight. Give yourself a big pat on, you know what, reach, reach up and pat the person in front of you and say, great for coming out, good job. Way to make it out to church on a Friday night. Uh, well done. You guys feel loved now? Except for the people in the back because nobody's patting you on the back. Uh, that's all right. The, you can, the sound guys can reach over and uh, get you guys. Um, but hey, so good to see everybody here. So good to be with you guys. Um, I was super impressed. I'm loving the banners that they've got, the, the piece of art that they've got in the foyer. And all of that to put our mind into a place where we can consider the truth of God, and not only the truths that God will share with us, but the truth about God and who he is. Such a fundamental thing that, like, this is the age we think about it, right? And, and I'll explain. Um, let's see if we can get the, the PowerPoint going. I'm not sure. Uh, I've got this clicker here. Um, but if you will, there's a you may have heard of the biosphere. There we go. Biosphere. This is actually the biosphere, too. It's down in Arizona, and it's, it's now owned by the University of Arizona. But back in the 90s, they did uh, these, these tests where the idea behind it is it's, it's, it's a self-enclosed environment. And so the, they wanted to experiment what factors influenced what, potentially using this model to start a colony on the moon or on Mars. Um, but as, the, as they you know, grew plants and trees and there were people in there and again all in this self-enclosed environment, they started to notice that the trees, when they would get to a certain point, they would just, you know, break. Uh, I, I, you guys wouldn't want me to drop a mic. But you guys get the idea. They would just would fall over. They would break. And they couldn't figure out why. Why would the trees all of a sudden just fall over? Uh, until they realized that what happens is trees need wind, right? Usually we think, oh, hurricane, uh, like the, the hurricane that's coming out right now, it's a category four, it's about to hit Florida, and we think, well, hurricanes break trees down. Well, what they actually do, what wind actually does to trees is it gives them uh, what's called stress wood. It makes them harder. It makes them stiffer. It allows them to grow stronger. And when you take the wind away, like they did in the biosphere, the, the trees never developed stress wood, so they would just fall over after a few years of growing. Well, I, I want to bring that into this conversation here tonight, folks, because we need to be stressed a little bit to grow, and specifically in our faith with God. I was stressed so much when I was in uh, college, James Madison, down in, in uh, Virginia, uh, and I remember going through this year of, of hell uh, where it was first a philosophy class uh, and then a world religions class that just stressed me to the point where I was coming home each night and saying, I don't know if there's a God. I really don't. Why are all these other religions believing that they're, they're correct? How can I say that I am? What about this philosophy class where we spent literally the first part of the semester just proving that God cannot exist? And so I'm coming home every night talking to my dad and saying, I don't know. I really don't know that you, you've given me the truth up to this point. I'm learning so much. I'm, I was so stressed with the simple concept of how do I know that there is a God and why should I recognize that there is a God? The crazy part about the philosophy class is then we spent the second half of the semester trying to prove that there is a God. <laughs> and I'm like, couldn't we have started with that? And I'm like, let's, let's put that in the beginning of the semester. But um, let's talk about that tonight a little bit more and, and, and speak about the simple, simple truth that Genesis 1-1 opens up. It's not a question. It's not a hypothesis or a theory that it's going to throw out there. It's just a very simple statement, so controversial for many people. In the beginning, God. Either God exists, either he is there and we must know him, or he does not. So let's talk about it. I want to begin today with uh, four world view, sorry, five worldviews on God. Five worldviews on God today, and just kind of look at what folks believe today. And we'll start with this very simply, naturalism. 
naturalism. Uh, folks like atheists and agnostics fall into this category. Anybody that says, well, I really don't know that there is anything out there. I don't know what to believe in, you know, uh, puts themselves more or less into this category. And the Bible talks about them in Psalm 14.1. The fool had said in his heart, there is no God. There were people that said that there is no God. And in fact, if you go back even to the ancient times, even when Jesus was around the Roman Empire, just the Hellenistic empires of, of Greece and others in that time, most cultures in that time said, if you were an atheist in that, in that culture, I mean, think about people that worship Zeus, right? And they said, listen, if you don't believe in any God, you would be cast out of society. They said that atheists were harmful to society, in fact. If you don't believe in anything, then what do you believe in? What do you stand for? Uh, really interesting concept. We, we understand that folks that fall into this category believe there is no God, no soul, no spirit. Man is a chance product of evolution and one day will be wiped out. Values and morality are subjective. It's whatever we say they are. Morals are your individual preferences. They say just do whatever you want, just don't hurt anybody. And if you ask them deeply and you begin to question what is right and wrong, and you begin to question on what they believe the value is worth, you soon find out that life is worth nothing. Life is worth nothing. You're a chance product of the universe that will soon be gone. Well, when life has little value, folks, when there is no soul, that means you can murder babies all you want. You know, they, they like to claim that 93%, that, that, that abortion is necessary because she, she was raped or, or that situation or she can't handle the baby. 95% of abortion happens just because she doesn't want the baby, not because of rape. But they'll, they'll tell that to you. We, it's just about murdering the kids. Life has no meaning eternally or now. More than ever today, folks, I, I just saw this online the other day, um, suicide rates are doubling over uh, the past three years. With developed countries, countries that are leaning into naturalism, leaning into atheism, have seen just a tremendous spike in depression, tremendous spike in suicide, because people say, then why? I saw this video of, of this, this just angry, it, it's always, you know, young people that are so militant, right? This, this young atheist guy that is just, just spewing garbage on God, right? And then you get to this video uh, uh, where he's crying on camera because one of his followers that was listening to him and was convinced that there is no God committed suicide, and he feels that he's personally responsible, and he should, feel that he's personally responsible because that is what this leads to. It leads to a life of chaos and despair. If you're taking notes, you can put that down. Naturalism leads to despair. The only way out is suicide. Your life has no meaning. And that is why today we see the legalization of all kinds of drugs. Because that's the only thing that makes you happy anymore. We see all of these music festivals, right? The Coachellas, the Burning Man, all of that stuff becoming so popular because people just want to escape life. They don't want to think about that their life is worthless. More than anything today, we want to travel, we want to do things that stimulate us because we don't want to think about life. And nobody teaches you this in school, right? You're a, you're a science teacher or... A, uh, your, your philosophy professor doesn't teach you this. By the way, this class is going to make you want to kill yourself. <laughs> Even though you kind of knew it going in, you're like, well, it's college in general. Um, but we don't talk about that. Pastor Mark Driscoll says, ever wonder why atheists don't have happy songs <laughs> or anything? Because nobody wants to talk about suicide or sing about it. We have theism. Theism includes, or what I lump in this category, is polytheism. Uh, tribal religions, think about like Native America, Aztec. Most ancient religions, think about, uh, you know, Zeus, for example. Some uh, elements of Hinduism uh, fall into this category. We see it, again, practiced um, in, in the old times. And here's an example, 1 Kings 18, 27. Remember when all the prophets of Baal are jumping around and Elijah mocks him and he says, call out with a loud voice for he is a God. Either he's occupied or gone aside or on a journey or perhaps he's a 
asleep and needs to be awakened. And so they cried with a loud voice and cut themselves according to their custom with swords and lances until blood gushed out. That is what just a general theistic uh, religion looks like. There is a spirit that is out to get you. You must sacrifice your kids. You must sacrifice other things to him to make them, to make them happy. I used to have, I wish I brought it with me, I've got at my house this, this small stone blade made out of this beautiful green rock sharpened to a fine razor edge with a, with a demon head on one side that was used for human sacrifices in South America. That is what this leads to. You must sacrifice everything to keep these angry gods, angry spirits happy. Moral values take the form of taboos, which are things that irritate uh, beings. You don't want to do certain things because they irritate this, this spirit uh, or, or these beings. There's rituals you must do. Ultimately, theism leads to a life of fear. If you're taking notes, theism equals fear. Second Kings 17.30 speaks against that when he says, you shall not fear other gods. You should not live in a place of fear of all these spirits and, and, and curses and taboos around you. You shall not fear other gods, small g. Solomon, towards the end of his life, lives in this fear, building altars for, for Baal and Molech and others. Paul goes into Athens, uh, Acts 17.22, and he says, you guys have even built this altar for a God yet unknown because you live in fear. What if we miss somebody? Theism is fear. Next, we get to pantheism. Pantheism, our favorite hostess of all time, Oprah Winfrey. She's so great, isn't she? Um, uh, great hair. Um, some Hinduism, Buddhism, the Sikh religion, New Age religions uh, would fall into this category. They believe, anybody that believes in pantheism will say, will say that only the spiritual exists. Everything is a part of God, and he is a part of everything. He's not really an individual. There's not just a God. It's more of a thing. It's more of an experience, a feeling. Do I sound like Oprah yet? More of a feeling. Um, there's only a life force. Man is just a part of this reality, this simulation. Everything is eternal and impersonal, uh, and, and you can't really pin anything down. There's really, it's, it's a gray area between good and evil, and again, we kind of decide what that is. Everything is what, what it is. Just be positive generally, just this general spirituality. And honestly, folks, I think a lot of folks, a lot of believers today in this country and in many other places, developed nations, fall into this, right? Uh, because uh, Oprah grew up a believer as well, right? But they fall into this because it's so easy to just generally be spiritual, just generally be a good person. And yeah, there is. I think maybe there's something out there. I don't know what it is. I don't want to offend anybody. And, and they kind of fall into this new age version of something is out there. I work with an individual like that today, one of the most just joyful people on the planet, right? She's, she's so incredibly positive, and this is all she believes in. Grew up a believer as well, but yet so lost. When we begin to have these conversations, and I say, uh, listen, what do you think about this, and what do you think about eternity? She says, Peter, I don't know about any of that, but it's, it's just about positivity, and, and, and having energy, and, and connecting with energy, and she walks around and does these exercises in the morning where you have to walk around barefoot because of energy, and, and things like that. It's just a hodgepodge of all these things. Just be happy, Ultimately, what happens, though, is when life hits you hard, right? You lose your job, you get sick, a friend or a family member dies. What do you lean on? This positivity? You call Oprah and say, Oprah, I need to confess? You've got nothing. And so when you believe in anything like this, something so undefined and ambiguous, it leads to powerlessness and hopelessness. Because there is no creator of you. There is nobody who loves you and looks out for you. You have no relationship with a God. You're on your own. You're lost. And if you dare to admit it, you have no inner peace. 
There is no God of John 3.16. There is nobody who loves you intensely that they would sacrifice their son for you. None of that. You are on your own. And there's no moral standard, so when somebody does evil against you, you can't say that that's evil because there is no definition of evil in your book. Well, that's pantheism for you. Then there's monotheism. This is what we're most familiar with. Uh, probably 60 to 70% of the planet believes in some form of, of Judaism, Islam, and then obviously perverted versions of Christianity and people like the Jehovah's Witnesses, right? So we, we get closer to the God of the Bible in many ways because they do believe there's a, an infinite God that exists. He is one. He created a finite and material world. The spirit world is real just as is the material world. Folks believe that humankind is the unique creation of God. People were created in the image of God, which means that we are personal, eternal, spiritual, and biological. Moral values are objectively set by a perfect being, God, and we will die and be judged as to how well we have lived for those values. But then, that's it. The problem is there is no more to that. Meaning the rest of your life, you live with a God that is your judge. The rest of your life, you live with a God that, that leads, to, that, that desires and demands of you a high level of perfection. Right? That's the only way you get to heaven. And that leads to two things. Either it leads to a life of, of pride and hypocrisy and self-righteousness, because we all then think we're doing so well. There's an element of people that think, no, I'm doing great. Pastor Mark says it leads to a life of funny hats. You walk into churches, you walk into synagogues and mosques, and you see people wearing hats, and hey, I've got a bigger hat. I'm holier than you. I've got a little hat. I'm slightly less holy, but I soon will have a bigger hat. Right? We have to dress a certain way, look a certain way, do certain things, because to please this God who will be a judge. It leads to pride, or on the other hand, it leads to exhaustion. Folks, people that, are not, that, that don't have a relationship with Jesus but claim to be Christians can fall into this category. You're, you're basically a monotheistic God-believer uh, that, that doesn't have a relationship with Jesus. You're either prideful in your religion or you're exhausted. Because as you fight through everything and you see cancer hits you and you get into a car accident and a ticket and, and something else happens and your boyfriend breaks up with you and you think, God, why are you punishing me? And you view everything as a punishment from God for all the sins that you're doing. And you just, you're just exhausted. You're so tired of religion. But yet you don't want to go to hell, so you've got to keep working. And so you're just exhausted and exhausted. And you have to follow the laws. And then the rabbis write some more laws. And then your pastor gives you more things to do. And then your, your um, whatever the mosque leaders are called, I forget. Um, but they give you more laws too. And so you live a life that is just hopelessly futile and exhaustive. It was the year 1496, a few years after Columbus discovered the Americas. A boy around 14 years old was walking through his hometown of Magdeburg, Germany, when he saw the local ruler, Prince Wilhelm of Anhalt, walking around emancipated, uh, sorry, emaciated, begging, carrying a sack on his back like a donkey, just starved, looking haggard, and it wasn't just a rough morning. I mean, he's been starving himself, right? just looking terrible. Uh, the, the, the boy would later write that he had so worn himself down by fasting in a vigil that he looked like a death's head, a mere bone and skin. The man, Wilhelm, had given up the realms of eternal uh, earthly nobility to save his own soul. He said, I must suffer, I must live in self-denial in order to gain God's favor. It was a medieval religious system, a system of self-effort and suffering. That's what Christianity had become in those times. That young man, 14 years old, became or was Martin Luther, the great reformer, who also started to live that lifestyle until he realized this is not what the Bible is about. 
Christianity is not about how many times you pray a day. It's not about how many rules you keep and, and if you can wear certain things or, or not or, 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 or worship a certain way or not or fast a certain amount of times. He says that's not what we see here. He says I would read Romans 1.17 when Paul says that the gospel is the righteousness of God revealed and I would hate the righteousness of God because it would speak to me that I am not righteous. It would speak against the sin in my life and I would say I can't be righteous no matter how much I try, no matter how much I try to suffer and self-discipline myself, I cannot reach the righteousness of God. And so we get to Christianity. Why should we know God accurately? Why should we know not just some form of God or an imaginary God, a God that might be convenient like the pantheists would love you to have or no God at all, as the naturalists would say, or just some God that gives you rules and makes you feel prideful for following them, the God of Islam and Judaism, but the real God. And this is it, folks. Just a simple verse, John 3, 16. Not only do we believe in a God that created us and a righteous God, but we also believe in a God that is full of grace and love. Folks, this changes everything. There is a God that not only gives us rules, but then he sends his son. He gives us his son to die for us. He himself comes to earth. And that is special. Because it transforms your life from misery or self-righteousness into a life of joy and love and walking in a relationship, a beautiful relationship of love unlike anything you've ever experienced before. That is why we need to know God for who He is. That is why we need to know God perfect and loving and gracious and righteous. His righteousness then is something we seek because we say, God, you are so good. So righteous. I want to be like that. I want you to guide me. I, I want you to, to teach me. As David says, man, I love being in your law. I love being in your word. Man, this is such good stuff in here. You teach me so much. Because we live in a different relationship. Man, when you love somebody and they tell you to do something, you know, my wife says, take out the trash. I don't look at her like, stop tormenting me. I say, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take out the trash. Uh, no problem, I'll, t I'll, I'll do things for you. But if the boss you hate, right, you work at Subway making, you're a sandwich artist. And a darn good one. I love those sandwiches. <laughs> They're cheap. <laughs> but your boss tells you to do stuff and sometimes you feel that way. Cause, probably because you don't love them. <laughs> they haven't sacrificed anything for you. All they do is taking away hours. <laughs> There's a different relationship there, Right? We live in a God with a God that loves us. I want to continue on to the second part of this message and, and, and share just a few pieces that really mean a lot to me because I talked to so many young people today and we've answered the why, right? If you don't want to live a life of despair and hopelessness and on the verge of suicide and exhaustion or a life of pride, then you need to know the real God. You guys with me? Amen? Yeah? So, so now the question becomes, well, Pete, how do I know? How do I know that the God that you're telling me about is the real God? How do I know that what you're telling me today is truth? Uh, and I have these conversations constantly with, with young people um, because we all go through that same experience, folks. You guys are going through the same thing I went through in college. Uh, and we all have those doubts. If you're a smart individual today, you don't just walk in here blindly and say, of course, yeah, no, obviously there's a God. I promise you, Pastor Gregory has at some point, you've had doubts about God, right? But you work through them. You find those answers, right? And, and let me share with you what, where I find my answers. You know, I've always said it, it's, it's almost like uh, having a, a, a plot, right? A graph. And when you see those points, data points, line up, all right? You see that the data points line up, and all of them are lining up in a row, and you say, I think we can conclude that there's a relation, that, that it's a line, right? It goes on. Okay, I think we understand where the data's going. I think we know where all of this ends up. 
And so nobody today is going to come and show you, here is God, I've, I've proven him, because guess what? Faith is uh, understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. Faith is the conviction of things not seen. Nobody's going to come here and prove to you that God is. God did not want it that way. But what he does give us is enough data points, if you will, to show us and lead us to the inevitable conclusion that he exists and who he is revealed in scripture. So I'll give you seven points really quickly about what that means to me, um, and we'll go from there. Uh, first of all, the concept of God. The universal concept of God. You travel anywhere, any tribe, any place, and 99.9% .9 of them will have some form of a concept of a deity and of a being. We are created, and God says it in Scripture in Romans 1. He says, I've made it known. Every single individual has an idea and a concept that there must be a higher power. There must be something over it all. Two, the origin of matter. The origin of matter. I'll quote here for you from the journal, The New Scientist. Uh, Stephen Hawking, in fact, said, for a long time, scientists have held that the universe was eternal and unchanging. This allowed them to avoid the God question, who or what caused the universe, because they re reasoned that a be beginningless universe needed no cause, right? So if everything's been around forever, if matter's been around forever, then you don't need to think about what started matter to begin with. And in fact, that God created something out of nothing, like we just read, can't be real. There can't be a God. They recognize that the, if the universe began to exist in the finite past, it begged for a cause that was outside of the time-space continuum. And Stephen Hawking went on record, says, a point of creation would be a place where science broke down. One would have to appeal to religion in the hand of God. The late Stephen Hawking. Well, guess what happened a few years ago? A, a group of international scientists kind of goes back, reevaluates the data, and comes out publicly, published again in a peer-reviewed uh, science journal. Alexander Vilenkin concluded by saying, and by the way, this is not like a deacon at some church, you know. <laughs> oh, Alexander Vilenkin, I know him. <laughs> it's a scientist, it's a theme of scientists, concluded by saying, all the evidence we have says that the universe has a beginning and scientists can no longer hide behind a past eternal universe and must face the problem of a definite beginning. You've got to face the fact that even science will point to the fact that there is a start to this thing. Matter came out of something, or rather, out of nowhere, and there was a cause. What is that original cause? Number three, We've got to believe in a God because of the evidence of intelligence. It's a world that is full of complexity, and yet in all of this complexity, we find incredible order. I mean, you look at the laws of physics and just how intricate they are and how, fit they, how, how they fit together. Albert Einstein, I'll quote him, was once at a party in Berlin, uh, was surrounded by other scientists and, and, and folks that you know, knew their stuff. And they, they actually assumed he was an atheist until he's, he said, oh, you guys, as they were talking about religion, I actually believe in a God. They said, how could you? How, I, I, what do you mean you believe in, in a God? And he says, listen, um, when I see, when I explore physics, right, a man that was, that was 100 years ahead of his peers at that time in exploring the dynamics of the universe as he explored creation, right, uh, and that's what, I mean, I believe good science is just the exploration of God and his creation. It's incredible. And so as, as Einstein is doing great works of science, he says, I see it in my mind as if I'm walking into this enormous library and everything is, is perfectly alphabetized and everything is perfectly ordered and I cannot but think that there is a higher intelligence that put it together that way. It doesn't happen by accident. There is evidence of intelligence in the world around us. God made it evident. Next, I believe, the, uh, the evidence for God is the uniqueness of humans. This cause, comes from a study, and you can see all the different ways that folks say that we are unique. Uh, everything from our faith, 
of, uh, our, our ability to do you know, abstraction like metaphors and symbols, our language, the tools we use, the philosophy we have, morality is huge, our culture, how we do science, nothing else in existence can do what humans do. And it's not because we're so special, we are, not because we made ourselves that way, but it points to the fact that, that something made us incredibly different from anything else out there. We are just such a huge outlier from the rest of creation. And it speaks to, again, that there was a purpose behind our design. Next, scripture and its prophecy and the accuracy of its prophecies. Uh, we could list them out, folks. We could just go to the fact that over thousands of years, all of these prophecies fit together in a united theme and in a single topic pointing to Christ and how many prophecies he fulfilled. One of my favorites is actually Daniel 8. When Daniel has this vision um, of, of this goat and a ram, and it just as you unravel the vision, it's about, well, there was this giant nation that gets overtaken by another giant nation, which gets split up into four parts, which gets then split up into two parts, and then comes together again. And then literally, like 300 years after that, right, maybe a little bit less, guess what? The Persian Empire gets taken over by Alexander the Great, which then, after his death, gets split up into four empires, then gets reunited again into two, and then gets taken over by uh, the Romans. Literally, within a hundred years, within a few hundred years. And you look at that and you think, this is marvelous. Because you don't see false prophecies happening like that. People like to prophecy and spend a lot of time just airing out whatever they think is going to happen in the future. You don't prophecy this kind of thing to such accuracy if there is not a supernatural source. Um, two more. The evidence of Jesus um, of, uh, as a deity through his resurrection. Um, back in the 90, I think it was 98-ish, maybe 94, somewhere, somewhere in that time, um, there, was a, there was a debate between a well-known uh, atheist, uh, Dr. Gary Habermas, and an apologist, Dr. Anthony Flew, and they actually, it was right here, East Coast, they grabbed um, the philosophy professors from, from places like the University of Pittsburgh, um, and James Madison, and UVA, and a couple of other places, and, and for two days, the debate raged on about the resurrection of Jesus, whether it happened or not, the evidence for, the evidence again, against. At the end of the debate, the five-judge panel ruled four of them for resurrection, and one said was indecisive. The panelists said later, later on on record, the historical evidence of Jesus' resurrection is strong enough to lead a reasonable mind to conclude that Christ did indeed rise from the dead. And the one guy that was indecisive says, due to the case against, against resurrection being only this strong, meaning it's so weak, I would have to think that it was time I begin to take the resurrection seriously. And finally, the last but not least, answered prayers and miracles. Folks, I know you guys are looking at that fish and thinking, I'm a great fisherman. I'm not. <laughs> That's why I said miracles and prayers. <laughs> I, I love this more than anything because I don't know about you guys, but God hears my prayers um, all the time. And some of you guys are, might be going through a place in life right now where God's, you feel like God's not hearing you at all or rarely, and you think, is there a God? I'm not having that relationship with him. I, I'll tell you this. I'm not going to say that God hears everyone and, and does everything I tell him to do, but there are people that live today that they are shocked when they pray and God doesn't answer. And they go back to their knees and saying, God, I must have done something wrong. What's going on here? Where am I not in your will in those moments? We're often, on the other hand, we're shocked when God does answer our prayers. Wow, God, you find one, I, get, I got one prayer answered. That's not a good place to live in. That's not where Christians live. Christians that live in the will of God, folks, God hears our prayers and answers them. And I can tell you, this happened like two weeks ago. This is the first fish I've caught in my life since I was six years old, and I caught like a goldfish. 
And it was, it was saying, Lord, man, I, I dedicate this day to you, and I want to just fellowship with these men. And heck, if, man, if it's, if it's your will to catch a fish, that would be great. Uh, but I want this to glorify you. If, if I catch one, I want it to glorify you. Literally, we get out on the water. I'm the first one to throw the fishing rod in. I don't know how to hold the thing. Like, the guy's, like, yelling at me, no, don't hold it there. You got to hold it here. I'm like, just throw it in. And it's still, like, the lure is still, I'm, like, still unreeling it. And, like, it tugs. And then I'm, like, trying to pull it in. Within, like, 30 seconds, I throw it in. It was like Peter. Jesus sends Peter to the water. I felt exactly like that. I'm like looking inside of its mouth for money at that point. I'm like, God, there's, this is the blessing. The blessings keep compounding. It was the only fish we caught that day. I'm telling it to you right now because remember my prayer at the beginning? I said, God, this is going to be for your glory. And I want to share it with you for his glory. I'm going to be telling the story till I die for his glory because I know he made that happen so that I could share that with you guys today and share it with others. He answers prayers. I could tell you about when we were doing car washes with, with our youth and, and it was raining down at that stoplight and it was raining at the other stoplights and muddy cars were traveling past our church where there was no rain and they were driving in and saying, oh, you guys aren't going to set up shop here for long. It's raining. And we've been washing cars for hours at that point. God answers my prayers. God answers prayers. I, I'll give you one more. I used to work with um, a young man. Um, I, I won't disclose the name, but great guy, very enthusiastic salesperson. I, I, I lead a little team of salespeople with, for my job. And it was his first big sale, right? He's just got out of training. He started working his pipeline, his first big sale. It was a, it was a big one. And it's a, it's a Saturday and uh, it's the last day of the month, right? So you got to close everything before the end of the month. And he's calling me, man, Pete, what do I do? I got this, I got that, you know? And I'm like, dude, watch. And he's desperate. So I'm like, perfect opportunity. I'm like, Abe, well, there's his name. Uh, <laughs> I'm like, dude, I'll, I'll pray for this even. He's like, yeah, please pray for it. Uh, dude, I'll pray for it, but you got to go to church, all right? You got to go to church at least one time. And I'll pray for it, and, and we'll see what happens. He texts me that night. Dude, it closed, it closed. And I'm like, now you got to go to church. <laughs> it happens. Stuff that we weren't expecting happens. When we live in the will of God, and I'm not saying that I always do church, I really don't, but, but man, God is so good and merciful that he, he gives these answered prayers and miracles that happen all the time to share for his glory and again to give me evidence. I, I walk away from these moments and I think, how could I even ever doubt when the most ridiculous things happen to me? You answer the most silliest prayers sometimes. How could I doubt your goodness? How can I doubt this God that loves me? Yeah, I, I, I want to wrap up, but I, I want to wrap up just with a very simple thought of, um, of Moses. I think so many of us, and I find myself in this position often, where it's so good to live with the knowledge of God and know why I have to believe in him and listen to this sermon about seven reasons why he exists and say, I, I believe you and I agree with you, Pete, and then walk out of here and still not live with God, right? Not feel that nearness with God. And we can say, Pastor Gregory, you go preach to me again. You go commune with God. You go pray to God. And you tell me what he says. And you tell me about all your answered prayers, because mine aren't getting answered. And I'll live with your holiness. And I'll live through your sanctification and your words. Instead of going up on the mountain and talking to God yourself, and being like Moses did when he would speak to him face to face, just as a man speaks to his friend. That's the kind of relationship we should be in. I don't care if I've convinced you that there's a God tonight. If you don't have that kind of relationship with him, it doesn't matter. You can believe all you want. This is why Jesus came and died for us, so that we could have that nearness 
so that you could love him, so that you could walk with him, so that you can speak to him. Even now as you're sitting and saying, God, thank you for letting me be here. As you walk out of here saying, Father, I want to glorify you as I step out of here. Be with me as you bring him your prayers and needs to walk in his will, to desire his will, to love him back intensely. The rest of it doesn't matter. Man, I just, I just pray that for all of us. To have that nearness as Moses did. There was no question of love there. There was no question of loyalty. Man, when you're with your friend and you're always talking, it's just a different feeling. My wife says, I love it when you're with me at parties. I said, well, that's very sweet of you. Why is that? And she says, sometimes you're at a party, and even when you're with friends, um, you kind of run out of things to talk about, and you, you, you can kind of get lost. You know, there's people doing their things. But when you're there, I love it because I can always come to you, and we can always talk, and it's just so comfortable being around you. And, like, the party is actually fun when you're there. I said, thank you. <laughs> it's so sweet of you. But that's the kind of relationship you have where no matter what happens around you, you always run back to God and say, God, it's really just better to be with you. I know I just spent, you know, an hour talking with my girlfriends, and you know what? That was good, but, man, I just wish I, I spent that time with you. That would have been more productive. I would have felt better. I would have learned more. And just praying and being and reading about you is such a better relationship. Amen? Um, can we conclude in prayer? Let's do that. Let's all stand. Um, I would invite anybody here that wants to pray out loud, you can do so now, and I'll just conclude in prayer. Even if you want to just stand in silence, church, and just come before God, the one that answers your prayers, the one that created you, the real and only God. There's one. And he's very real. Man, I pray that you come before him and just feel his love and his goodness tonight.